Mein Name ist Matteo Kries, ich bin einer der beiden Direktoren des Vitra Design Museums und ich möchte Sie auch im Namen meines Co-Direktors Marc Zehntner da hinten ähm, ganz herzlich begrüßen zur Pressekonferenz anlässlich der Ausstellung Making Africa. Wie Sie sich vorstellen können, ist die Ausstellung ein sehr internationales Projekt, deshalb werden wir die Pressekonferenz auf Englisch durchführen. Ich hoffe, das ist okay für Sie. Wenn Sie bestimmte Dinge nicht verstehen, können Sie uns natürlich auch nachher ansprechen und wir können dann auch gerne nochmal auf Deutsch Erläuterungen geben. Und es wird ja auch eine der beiden Ausstellungsführungen auf Deutsch geben. Um, dear guests, I would like to welcome you to this press conference for the exhibition Making Africa. Um, I've just explained that as we have so many international guests here today, especially of course from African countries, we'll hold um, this press conference in English. And with me on the podium, I want to introduce uh, Uta Schnell from uh, the German Cultural Foundation who supported the exhibition. Uh, Petra Joos, Chief Curator of the Guggenheim Bilbao Museum, who is the co-producing partner of the exhibition. Amelie Klein, who is uh, the exhibition curator from the Vitra Design Museum. And Okwui Envesor, Director of Haus der Kunst and Advising Curator of the exhibition. Um, as a design museum, we are always aiming to realize exhibitions that show how closely design reflects um, changes in society and technology and politics. Um, we want to do exhibitions that offer unexpected perspectives on design and enlarge our view of what design actually is. We want to do exhibitions that create connections between the past and the present and the future, exhibitions that question what we believe to know, uh, that destroy cliches and that build cultural bridges. And we want to show exhibitions that show the close link between design and other disciplines like art, architecture, urbanism. And all this is true for the exhibition Making Africa. Um, the idea to do this exhibition uh, came from the fact that we observed enormous changes on the African continent. Um, while in the 1980s and 90s, we all know that there were decades of uh, political and economical struggle on the continent. Africa is currently a place with an incredibly fast economical development and also a development in politics, in technologies and social structures. There is a growing middle class, there, is a, uh, there are growth rates of many economies that are far beyond 5%, sometimes even 10% a year. New internet infrastructure is allowing quicker communication and some cities like Lagos or Nairobi have become vital start-up Uh, places that develop products which are exported internationally. And all this created a new context in which we thought it is time to do an exhibition that sheds a new light on design um, in Africa. An exhibition that does not show, um, again, material folklore or humanitarian design like water filters or solar cookers, but we rather wanted to look at the possibilities than the problems of this continent. And Rather than showing solutions that are imported on the African continent, we wanted to show the great work that emerges from Africa itself with a great new generation of creators and makers and thinkers. To do so, we deliberately chose objects from very diverse fields. <clears throat> so you will see in the exhibition exhibits from furniture design, product design, of course, but also from typography, from digital design, from media design, And very often you couldn't even say whether what we are showing is now design or art. We are also having works from the field of architecture and urbanism. <clears throat> and um, this is exactly what the exhibition is about, to show that um, in Africa there is an open understanding of design, one that does not limit itself to definitions which often have been created by Western people in the 20th or even in the 19th century, but um, that a new context in the 21st century brings about new work crossing the disciplines and reaching out into society. Of course, we're aware that we cannot show one homogenous African design. It's not an exhibition that wants to prove that there is something like an African style or African aesthetics, um, because we're speaking about a huge continent with uh, far more than 50 countries, uh, thousands of ethnies and languages, but I think what the exhibition shows is that there are new collective experiences, <clears throat> new realities, new themes, which are visible in the works that we are showing from these very 
different disciplines. So we decided to confront those works from very different disciplines to show those themes that run through these different works. And of course, we see that design is always connected to our daily lives and to solving daily problems. But it is not only about that. Um, to improve our lives, design can also be seen as a tool to speculate about our future, to question things, to mirror identities, to reflect about everyday culture. And all this, which is true for design everywhere in the world today, uh, could not be shown better than um, uh, lo by looking at design at the African continent today. So to do this very ambitious program, of course, we had to do quite an intense research. Uh, Amelie, our curator, she made in total uh, six very long research trips to many African cities and regions. Um, in many of those cities, she organized uh, local think tanks and um, um, gatherings with the local artists and designers, very often supported by the local Goethe Institutes. Um, she interviewed more than 70 designers, artists, architects, scholars, and thinkers. She visited studios and workshops, galleries, museums, companies, fab labs, hacker spaces, as she emphasized. So um, she may explain what that is. Um, and the result of this is an exhibition that includes around 280 objects from um, 120 different designers, artists, and architects. And I'm especially happy that several of them can be here with us today. And I really want to give them especially a very warm welcome because um, they have had quite a long trip. Um, so the people who are here with us today are Caro Akpokiere, excuse me if I may not pronounce <laughs> one name very correct, you may correct me, okay. Uh, François Borin, this is easy, Nicolai Sion, Ndeye Nafisatou Diop, Omar Victor Diop, Amadou Fatoumata Ba, Yinka Ilori, Hector Mediavilla, Dr. Ngom, Sindizo Nioni, Ifeanyi Oganbu, Justin Plunkett, Bai Sule, Daniele Tamanyi, and Hisham Lalu. And I want to mention that one of the guests, Dr. <laughs> Ngom from Dakar, he worked the whole last week here in front of the museum to decorate our museum building with a graffiti that br brings something of the visual richness and intensity to our pure white Frank Gehry building, um, which is probably an experience that will not appear so... <laughs> and actually, some, some days ago, when a doctor was nearly finished, we saw him standing in front of the under building and looking at the <laughs> long... <laughs> yeah, he said, this is another really nice wall. <laughs> so, um, yeah, to finish, let me... Uh, thank the, the people and institutions that have collaborated with us on, on that project. Of course, I want to thank, firstly, the German Cultural Foundation, represented here by um, Uta Schnell, who gave the exhibition a significant financial support, but who were also a very important discussion partner for research uh, that gave advice um, for, uh, with contacts and the knowledge they have at the, at the German Cultural Foundation, because they have a a special program uh, in the last years that focused on Africa. So they have really gathered a huge network um, regarding Africa, and we were really happy to um, work with you and um, draw a lot of knowledge from that network. I also want to um, thank the Art Mentor Foundation from Lucerne, who also supported the exhibition. And I would like to thank also the members of the advisory board that we created to do the exhibition. Um, Okwui Enveso was part of those people, Yelda Bayraktar, Pierre-Christophe Gam, Porky Heffer, Koyo Kuo, Hisham Lalu, Odessa Legema, Mugendi Mrita, and Azu Nwagbogu. And last not least, I want to thank uh, the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao. As I said, they co-produced the exhibition with us, so they gave a financial contribution to the production of the exhibition, and they will show the exhibition this autumn in their own building, which uh, by coincidence or not is also built by Frank Gehry. <laughs> um, and uh, it was also great to have um, uh, Petras and her colleagues input into the, the curatorial preparation. So they also were part of the discussions that we had 
to do the exhibition. After the Guggenheim Museum, the exhibition will go to the Centro de Cultura Contemporánea in Barcelona, and also the chief curator of that great exhibition space is here today, um, as are many other museum colleagues who are considering to show the exhibition. So we're really happy that this exhibition will surely travel to other venues after Bilbao and, and Barcelona. And I think also this shows the great interest in sharing this um, different view on Africa that the exhibition conveys. Um, last not least, I want to mention the, the um, little catalog we did. So <laughs> everything which is not <coughs> in the exhibition may be here in the catalog. And I also want to mention that in the gallery in front of the museum, we have another exhibition called Architecture of Independence, African Modernism. It's a small show, but it's a very nice addition to the Making Africa exhibition because it looks at one uh, special period uh, in the African uh, modern history, the post-colonial era, when a lot of um, modernist architects built spectacular buildings on the African continent. And the curator of that show, Manuel Herz, documented that moment in architectural history together with the renowned <coughs> photographer Ivan Bahn. And we're happy to have those two exhibitions that resonate very nicely together at the same time. And there's also a beautiful book published by Scheidegger and Spies about that phenomenon uh, that we're showing available in the, in the museum shop. So when you write about the exhibition, you might also mention that there are these two different projects. Okay, so I want to hand over to Okfui to maybe say a few words about how we, we work together on, <laughs> on that exhibition and what your view on that project was. Well, um, <clears throat> thank you so much, Mathieu and Emily, for um, inviting me to be a part of your process. Um, I, I should like to begin by congratulating Emily for a really fantastic exhibition. Um, I didn't quite know what to expect when uh, I arrived, um, but I was really thrilled to see the exhibition through the lens of a design museum uh, with a, an incredible formal elegance and precision and clarity. And I think that for me, this is what really adds yeah, wonderfully to what the exhibition might end up being. In my view, it's less an exhibition about design, than uh, I should say this. It's less an exhibition about design, but more an exhibition that blurs the lines between design and art. And the kind of formal inventiveness that artists, designers, and others bring to thinking about all the things that you mentioned, the relationship between Africa and the contemporary. I think it's really the question of the contemporary that makes the exhibition, in my view, uh, incredibly um, energizing to, to, to witness. Uh, but having said that, I think the question one has to pose is, you know, what view of Africa does one derive from this exhibition? And that was a question that I was asked by one of the um, you know, members of the TV, and I don't suppose that you will see a view of Africa. It's a kaleidoscope, it's a kaleidoscopic view, and there is an intensity uh, you know, in the exhibition that I believe um, really surpasses some of the pitfalls of exhibitions that try to sort of to tackle Africa and design. And here, um, what I should say is really the language of material culture in the contemporary that becomes increasingly very, very visible. And I think the, the logic of the proscenium that you've used, these different layers of, um, of material and information and objects layered on top of each other, um, um, I find quite you know, thrilling to see. So congratulations, Emily, for um, a fantastic you know, show. And let me just simply add one more point that I believe that is really essential. When, when a museum like Vitra undertakes 
to make a project like this, I think is, it has you know, great significance. It has great significance for you know, many reasons because it's really a confluence of many um, forces that um, brings all these different energies together in, 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 one, in one space. And, and I hope that the public that sees the exhibition you know, can draw uh, some lessons from it in terms of how we curate Africa, how we think Africa, and the um, incredible richness um, of this current generation uh, in terms of what they are producing. So that's my take. Thank you, Akui. Um, I, I may remind that I think one, <coughs> one curatorial approach that you insisted we should add to the exhibition, or one layer, was to connect the, the look at um, the contemporary um, mm. evolutions in design with um, the post-colonial era when design already had become a tool for mm. reflecting about an, an African Mm -hmm. um, future. Maybe you can say a few words about that. You know, well, I mean, I think that it's, um, it's it seems to me that you you can't do. I mean, of course, one can do whatever you want to do in an exhibition, but I think that the tabla rasa approach doesn't seem to me to be um, necessarily um, um, interesting, and and that is why I think that the the connection between the historical. Uh, or the immediate historical period, really looking back 50 years and, and uh, 60 years and now, that there are these linkages, there are linkages uh, in terms of what one could call the politics of form. And the politics of form that you find, let me give an example. If you look at Ella Natsui, for example, it's very easy to look at Ella Natsui and think that the recent, you know, um, you know, sculptures that are woven out of bottle caps, uh, are, you know, just a rediscovery of how to work with discarded material. His very early work was really working with these uh, trays, these wooden trays that market women, this was in the early 70s, more than 40 years ago, looking at these wooden trays that market women would use in, in Ghana and uh, trying to sort of to find a way to unlearn, you know, um, the kind of academic language he learned at the university, to unlearn his training. Uh, so by unlearning, he was also working to undo uh, the, the notion that one cannot really learn from the immediate historical past of Africa. And, and therefore, um, that continuation in the, in the current work uh, is part of you know, Anasui's exploration of, and, you know, uh, of different materials, but more fundamentally, what I would call politics of form. So it's when you look at a more historical works that you begin to sort of to engage with this notion of the politics of form and the kind of post-Westernism of some of the designs. And I think this is something that I think is really quite vital, that if you look at the work of Sedu Keita, for example, you see, you know, design functioning in a kind of um, what I, Ali Mazrui from Kenya will call the triple heritage, at the intersection of, Afri of Africa, Islam, and Christianity. And how does that really furnish, you know, the design landscape with new, you know, techniques, new languages in order to function? And you can see how that kind of carries through in Umu C's piece. If you look at Umusi, which is a kind of the language of haute couture, and if you look at that and the, the use of raffia and the everyday woven material, it could be the mats that the women are sitting on in, you know, the, uh, in Sedu Keita's you know, photographs. So this layering and this essential um, appropriation of the past and making them contemporary I think immediately becomes very clear. And of course, if you look at the drum magazine <coughs> pictures of the uh, Cape Murphy drags from the 50s, and you think about the politics of gender and identity and sexuality going on in South Africa today. So there are all these linkages, so there's no tabla rasa. Mm. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Okri. So 
Now, um, Amalie Klein, can, can you say something about your curatorial approach, the concept? Uh, well, obviously, I do believe that this is a show very much about design. <laughs> <laughs> I think that uh, even though, as Matteo said, we deliberately chose objects from a, a very large variety of disciplines, um, Azun Wagbogu, who is uh, sitting in the first row, he is one of the authors of the uh, catalogue, uh, gave a very nice definition of design. And he said, design is the meta discipline that glues together all other disciplines. And I think this is a very nice uh, way of looking at design. So we, we look at all these different uh, disciplines and all these different, um, uh, how do you say, like uh, uh, what can be designed. So we, we, we speak about uh, designing processes, designing infrastructure, designing uh, social interaction, if you want. And so we uh, are looking at a very, very broad and yet very contemporary def definition of design. And um, so what we try to do here by looking at all these different pieces of work, um, we try to look at, as Matteo said, how design can and should accompany or even enhance change. And um, you know, this change is not only happening in Africa, obviously, but uh, everywhere on a global perspective. And this is why it is so relevant for us. Um, and so we, we think that uh, El Anatui, for example, gives, although it is a piece of art, obviously, gives very interesting insights of how to deal with material. And material, obviously, and how to deal with material is very much a question of design. Um, so this is the approach that we, that we took. Um, we cannot, obviously, as, as, as uh, you both already said, cover the entire continent. This is not what we aim to do. Um, it was very early on, very clear to us that this is not going to be possible. There's way too much of a variety. You know, one single city as Johannesburg or Cairo has enough amazing design to, cu to, to fill the whole house uh, and do an entire exhibition on. So this was not the aim. The aim was rather... Um, redefining design and looking at uh, new solutions, new innovations, uh, new approaches um, of what design can do to uh, accompany and enhance change in society. And this is not a new project. Uh, like uh, with, with uh, what Okwi said, uh, design also has a history <coughs> of, of shaping society, early modernism, was a utopian social project. It's not about you know tubular steel or, or doing furniture. It was a utopia on for society, um, and we believe that the 21st century needs utopian uh, a utopian design, if you want. It needs design that goes beyond a chair. <laughs> and this is maybe <laughs> something <laughs> bold to say <laughs> here. <laughs> uh, and yet we think it is important. And let me tell you. These are things that uh, people here think about. Um, and uh, what I would also like to say is um, this is a huge, huge communal project, a very collaborative project, which is also one of the statements that we claim design should be in the 21st century. So this whole project is very much uh, in these in this, uh, terms or in this uh, idea and philosophy. Um, I we met so many incredible people. I personally met so many incredible people on the continent. And um, I really, I'm looking back to the most, at the most, two most interesting, exciting and extraordinary years in my life, I would say. It's been extremely exhausting. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, um, oh, we can say something about that too, I would say. Um, but uh, it's, it's, it's been incredibly, incredibly enlightening, enhancing, <coughs> and, and I learned so much from all these people from the continent and the diaspora, and my colleagues, I must also say. It would not have been possible to make this happen without their help. Um, so this is a huge thank you to this corner, <laughs> maybe also there, <laughs> and uh, to all of the people who, who came. I'm very, very <coughs> grateful, and everybody who's not here today, it's been amazing and extraordinary. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Akwe. Mm -hmm. <coughs> well, Peter. So, um, I will not... Um, 
I will not uh, have a speech here because I think it's not uh, my, it's not uh, to do it here because the, the protagonists are sitting here besides me and they are here in the space in, uh, in, in Weil am Rhein. Um, we are really, for us it is an honor for the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao uh, that uh, the Vitra Design Museum uh, wanted to share with us uh, this wonderful project. I have seen the exhibition and it's really amazing. Um, we would thank uh, everybody who is working, who was working on this project, but also who will be working <coughs> intensively on the project in Bilbao because it's, it's continuing. So uh, thank you very much, Amelie. Thank you, Matteo, uh, and everybody who is here and will be supporting the exhibition. Uh, as Matteo said, um, it's only a metaphor, but uh, on the other side, uh, the exhibition stays at home because it goes from one Gary uh, building to another. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we are very confident that uh, this will be a very good omen for the, for the future. Thank you so much, everybody, and... I think it will just be a little bit larger in your space. <laughs> <laughs> you have, yes. like, four times as much space. Yes. <laughs> so a reason to come back uh, to see it in Bilbao. Yeah, or it is another way to walk through them, because some of the images will be bigger, or there will be more works, or whatever. But the idea is Amelie's idea, so this will be, of course, uh, preserved. Thank you. It's actually the same with me. There's nothing much to add. The Cultural German Foundation is very, very happy to be part and, uh, of this endeavor and of this great show and uh, to fund it because actually you said everything uh, why we are funding it and it's, it's basically two big things. The one is that we wanted exactly that when we started the Africa, Africa Focus four years ago with the, with the foundation because we had the impression that international meant basically North America and Europe uh, and a lot of parts of the world and especially the continent is not part of enough of uh, international work and that's why we wanted to encourage institutions, museums, publishers, festivals, clubs to, to, to address the very dynamic uh, scenes, cultural scenes, uh, artistic <coughs> scenes in, on the continent and the Vitra did it. <laughs> Uh, and they did it in a way which we think, when Matteo Kries was presenting us the idea, in a very um, zukunftsweise and giving, giving the direction for a lot of other institutions because exactly of what Emily was saying, they did it in a very cooperative way and in a very collaborative way, which I think this is the way, or the foundation thinks this is the way to go about it if you work uh, with the continent for reasons of historical adequacy and for reasons of politics of representation. You can't just uh, do it alone on your own. You've got to work with uh, uh, urbanists, designers, curators from the continent. Um, and the second thing which has been mentioned as well is of course this, this very broad, comprehensive, contemporary, innovative uh, understanding of design uh, which the Vitra Museum follows up to. And this is what the foundation uh, persuaded, uh, and that's what, why we're very happy to be part of it. And of course, the catalog in which all this process is documented. And um, we would hope that the show is not only has success here, of course, and is not only shown in Bilbao, um, but as well on the continent. That'd be good. There yes. are some discussions with uh, <laughs> some places there. <laughs> Um, we hope so too, yeah, and um, we'll work on it. Thank you very much. Um, well, we'll have a guided tour through the exhibition with Amelie now uh, when we go over to the museum. Amelie will do the tour in English. For those who uh, um, rather want to follow a German-speaking tour, there is her assistant, uh, Julia Friedel. Um, and I have to mention that Julia worked with Amelie and Roni Chan, um, besides her, on the exhibition. So they were the curatorial team, and also thanks to the two of them very much. Um, Julia will do the tour in German, so um, you can decide whom you want to follow. Um, well, before we go over, um, I would like to open the discussion. Are there any questions uh, so far that you would like to ask to one of us? Well, you haven't seen the exhibition, yes. So. Yeah. A 
I'm sorry, can you repeat? Hold on for the microphone. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. <coughs> sorry. Uh, what chance do you see for African countries that they have in the moment in Europe, they have kind of a bonus here. There is so much attention to, to Africa from people, from this exhibition. So uh, let's say I'm interested to know in the, in, the, in the view on the other way. Do you want to answer this? <laughs> um, I think that the most um, interesting chances uh, are I, I assume you, you want to address whether there's going to be collaborations and, 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 and industrial production of, of pieces coming from Africa. Is that what you're asking? I don't know, maybe. Um, well, I, I'm not sure because I don't think that in general the future of design, and again, this is a bold thing to say here, I don't think that the future of design is necessarily and exclusively in mass production and industrial production. And the <laughs> biggest chances that I see uh, for design from Africa is um, uh, to, to uh, <coughs> convey knowledge. And also, I mean, um, very interestingly, and beyond the radar of, of many of us, there is a lot of digital production coming from Africa. One app that we have in the exhibition um, <coughs> has been downloaded um, two million times from 180 countries all over the world within one week. So there is, there is a lot of potential for virtual, uh, for, for, for real, concrete um, um, business, if you want, if this is, if this is what, what your question was aiming to. I would, I would add, I mean, it's not only limited to business, it's at the end it's an exchange of ideas and people mm -hmm. and, and thoughts. Mm -hmm. So that may lead to Know, eco economical uh, collaborations, but it also may lead to a to just a, a closer exchange of uh, in in the in the cultural field whether it is uh, to do common projects, whether it is to bring an exhibition from here to an African museum, which w may be one way to uh, one result of such a project. Mm. So, um, or the other way around. Or the other way around, yes, but. I think, Amelie, you probably agree that we haven't thought about <laughs> what can be a bonus for Africa because we rather felt it's us who are learning. You know, it's not something we are bringing to the continent. It's, it's more that we felt <coughs> um, the designers or the artists that we're showing, they don't need a bonus. Um, they, are, they do great work <laughs> and what they merit is to be shown and, and to be known. So, um, I mean, so we, we didn't have a concrete um, result in mind that happens on the African continent. What we'd rather want to create is a platform for what is happening, because we think that this, um, what you also find in the catalog, is not very known outside. And it's, you know, it's being published since a few years through the internet, through media. So since um, uh, social media um, are available, this, th this, is, this was the first channel to bring this out, outside. Um, 10 or 20 years ago, there were very few publications about what we are showing here, um, nearly none. So people had to travel there, look at it, and now there are channels to, to spread it to the world. So this is what we wanted to explore. And I'm sure there will be results, but I would say it's not up to us to define what, what the results are. Yeah, Mr. Invisor, I have a question for you, uh, a bit apart. Uh, you will be organizing the, Vien uh, the yes. Venice Biennale. Uh, what part will Africa play there? <laughs> if I'm allowed, allowed to, to ask some questions here. That's very, well, <laughs> well, I'm sorry, I, uh, I, it's an international exhibition. I, 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 I don't know, no, no. I, you know, today I refused to answer a question about Australia and in Venice Biennale, and I will do the same here about Africa. What's the main difference of the African experience in design in relation to the 
in your essentially view on design. I mean, this would be kind of an interesting uh, trick to, to say to say uh, to talk about for you. I mean, what's the main diff main difference in the experience of design in Africa in relation to here? <coughs> wow. <laughs> Well, I mean, I think it's a, it's 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 an interesting question to sort of to, to search for differences because I think we are really looking at um, you know you know different historical conceptions of what design really represents, and I think one of the, the key things that I think is important about this exhibition is really the tension between the expressive and the applied, right? And and here. Um, I, you know, you can see that in, if you look um, at the way in which um, the the use of you know different forms to make very specific things, um, and um, that is really no different than say in the West. It really isn't you know to to make a piece of kente cloth and to have three meters of kente cloth is really working at the very highest level of craft. And it's laborious. It is really you know, bespoke to the ultimate because no kente cloth is alike. You know, because it's, and the craftsmen you know, in this context uh, are no different from the craftsmen in Europe because I think it's really about individuality not about mass production. But I think, you know, so um, these, these distinctions for me will be really superficial. And I think Emily pointed to something that I believe is very interesting, that design is not only necessarily about mass production. And it's, it's so if we look at the very different layers of the artisanal and the way the uh, expressive and the applied, you know, come together. Um, I think we see immediately um, that design itself really you know, defies you know, cultural you know, boundaries. Of course, they do look different in terms of iconography, in terms of um, you know, the use of science and the, the language of science in, you know, in, in relation to very specific you know, you know, you know, parts of of of, um, of of Africa, so the difference say, between kente cloth and aquete, which is a, another another kind of woven, uh, you know, design, or to look at um, you know Cuba cloth, say for example, and you know European abstraction, and so where do, you know where does the line you know who influences whom in this sense. So I think you know the, the, the really I, I don't see that there is a very specific difference. I think what you see in, in, in design in this sense is the use value of the design themselves are very different in particular locations. Maybe I can add something um, <clears throat> to this discussion. I think uh, or I would la rather add uh, a question. Um, what does mass production or the production of a unique piece mean in times when we can produce a million different pieces by pushing one button, uh, 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 you know, uh, and following an algorithm program? Th there is no such a thing anymore uh, as mass production and individual pieces because we can mass produce individual pieces, mm -hmm. and this is when you know the the ultimate. Um, the ultimate distinction of what design uh, is defined by uh, in, rel in, 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 in relation to art is basically nil, you know? I mean, this was one of the big, big things. The other one is function. Now, what is function? Is it not a function to evoke memories or thought? I think it is a very important function. And why would art be the only discipline that you know, should have this function. I think in times of change, it is important that we allow, and I'm quoting Okwi, we allow designers to make unfunctional things. Because the point is we need experimentation, we need innovation. And innovation and experimentation, you know, can fail. And this is the, this is the, the, the essence of, of, of an experiment. And it is also not mass-produced, obviously. Um, 
also this is the this is also the the essence of an experiment and i think um in order to be innovative we need functionless design mm -hmm. and this is when design art and all these questions really don't matter anymore i think there's another you know issue that one has to think about the the the, the relationship between design and manufacture you know, because there, there's a lot of design that goes on in Africa that are manufactured elsewhere. You know, in 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 in, the, in today is made in China is the is the rule, but in the 70s it's made in Taiwan. You know, and no, but it's true. So there's a there's a difference between design and manufacture. So that there are many designs that are made in Africa that are manufactured elsewhere because of the differences in infrastructural um, you know, um, ability. So, and that is what, you know, one of the things that we really have to think about, these differences in infrastructural ability. And the more the infrastructural capabilities in African countries grow, there are a number of things that happen. It's, you know, you have more trained people, you have more jobs, you have, you know, uh, more homemade stuff, that even though today, say, something like the wax print fabric, you have a lot that is printed in Africa, but there are also people who desire, you know, some of those materials that are printed in Holland, the so-called Holland days. You know, my mother, you know, had a huge business of importing what was called George, um, which is another kind of you know, woven <coughs> material that comes from India. Well, or, or, the, or, the, you know, or the lace that um, many Nigerian women wear, they are made in Austria, but they are designed <laughs> because they go, they go to the places where they find the best manufacturers. So that has to do with their level of quality control. So that, and this is one of the things that we don't really speak about. So they, you know, they, they find the sources so that lace, where is the best lace woven that Nigerian women love in Austria? And um, Duro Olowu, who, had, you know, who has a piece in the, in the, in the show, you know, the, the places where he sources his lace is in Austria because he's really going to those places where you know, Nigerian designs have circulated over several decades. And they have, you know, in the archive, some of these designs, some of these patterns that appeal to very specific sensibilities in the local context. So I think we need to sort of to look at this relationship between design and manufacturing. <clears throat> okay. Some years ago, I have met uh, Sheikh Diallo, um, and I wrote a text uh, for his um, a book, Made in Mali. And uh, speaking with him, I, I discovered a lot of things that I didn't know. <laughs> um, but what, uh, what I was uh, now um, would like to ask you is um, about all the people that uh, were collaborating with him for in, in Mali for uh, his masterpiece. Um, what kind of uh, look uh, this exhibition gave, if it gave it, uh, to all the work of these people? For instance, in the, in the text I wrote uh, um, for this catalog, I was very I I, I wanted to to stress uh, a particular episode that uh, that Sheikh Diallo told to me that one day he he, he broke a calabash. And he gave it back to a lady, and she, she, um, so she did. saw it again, and that was very, uh, that was very important for me. To this is a, um, a capacity, a skill of African common people to 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 do magnificent things. So not only the designer, design in Africa is made by every by common people. So I would like to know how this uh, exhibition um, and if gave a look to this, to this uh, aspect. Um, <coughs> deliberately, we did not look at uh, the anonymous craft. 
because this is something that has been covered in ethno ethnological and ethnographic uh, exhibitions a lot. We wanted to point out um, individuals who um, suggest interesting, innovative solutions. Uh, what we do, however, and this is referring to, what, to the little anecdote that you just gave us and shared with us, um, we also, by looking at the work of those people, we also look at maybe an attitude towards how to design on the continent. And one attitude that is uh, essentially important, what I would say, is the making. And this is exactly what, what you've just been describing, you know, taking whatever <coughs> resources available and making something. And again, I'm quoting Okwi, there is a political dimension to making in, in, a, in a time when not only the continent, but the entire world is flooded with mass-produced cheap products. Um, there is a, uh, it is challenging, I'm quoting, the complacency of mass production. And I think this is essential and this is very important. And this is something that we find in, 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 in many, many, many pieces in the exhibition. The, uh, the power of making is, is um, is largely underestimated, and it's rather an attitude than anything else, I would say. Okay, uh, I would suggest we, we go over to, to the exhibition. There are these two guided tours, and I also wanted to mention, for those of you who are interested in learning about the other small exhibition in the gallery, there's Manuel Herz, who is standing there, who will be in the gallery, so if you have some questions for him, you can also ask him. But the tour are starting in 10 minutes, something Three like that. Three o'clock? What time is it? Now. Now, okay. 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 Uh, five minutes five in the museum. Minutes. <laughs>